right, good morning, Cross Point. I just want to invite you to stand to your feet, whether you're online or here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Let's just worship together. to see you today in the room and online. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and we're so happy that you're here with us today. We here at Cross Point exist to 
point people to Jesus and to inspire them to live the cross-shaped life. We do that through worship. We do it through discipleship. We do it through serving and sending. And one aspect of sending is taking the church outside the walls. And another aspect is bringing people here. And we have events throughout the year that are designed to help you uh, give you a boost to bring people in. And one of those that I want to talk to you about real quick is a thing we're doing in the children's ministry, the next-gen ministry. It's called the Candyland Chocolate Factory Nutcracker Bash. All right, how many things can you squeeze into a name? And uh, this is, as you can as figure out, it's just a fun thing for families. It is a great opportunity on December the 10th for you to go out and find some neighbors that have kids and to invite them to your church. This is a fun fellowship opportunity. Lots and lots of games and lots of candy will be handed out. Uh, it's a great thing, and it's one of those great, great low-hanging fruit things that you can do to reach out and, and, and live out the cross-shaped life by, by inviting your neighbors. So put that on your calendar. Tell your family, y'all come. We need volunteers. We need all that. Just help us out however you can. Uh, but first, I want everybody to stand up. I want you to welcome your neighbor. I want you to ask them who they're bringing to the Candyland Chocolate Factory Nutcracker Bash.
Take a seat. It is so good to have our folks leading. Georgie, it is great having you back. She had a baby, and she is back with us again. So grateful for those with talent. Hey, listen, we're so grateful that you're here, uh, and thank you for all that you do to support the life of this church. And I am a beneficiary just with my family week in and week out of having a place. Let me tell you how joyful it is to see uh, your kids making good decisions. This morning, my daughter has been at home for uh, Thanksgiving, and she said, hey, Dad, uh, I have a church that uh, she goes to at at college, and she says, I'm going to drive home uh, back to my uh, place of worship during the school year. She said, I'm going to go home early because one of my good friends is getting baptized. And I thought, you know what? You've got your priorities in the right place. So she got up early and drove to her church to watch her friend get baptized. So that is an encouragement. And you have poured into the life of my family, and I'm so grateful for that. Today, I want you just to know as you give, you are giving to uh, helping raise families. You are giving to partnering with parents, and uh, you are being a part of something really, really special that's going to last well beyond the days that we are here in this room, but also way beyond the days that we are on earth. So thank you. So if you desire today, as we move into a time of giving, to support us at this church, there's a couple ways to give. One, if you're in the room, you can simply give at one of our giving stations all throughout the room. And uh, you can also go to crosspointchurch.com slash giving. Or you can go to the app, and you can give on the app. Or you can go to a text, and you can text 678-582-8180. Listen. As we give today, remember you're not giving to something that you yourself can do. You are giving because you believe in the God who is able to do beyond what we could ever imagine. And so when we worship in spirit and truth in just a few minutes, you're going to, uh, you're going to take part in the Lord's Supper as pastor leads. And we want to encourage you, if you are in the room right now and you have not gotten your elements, would you just slip out just a moment during the giving time and get one at the back tables on the, on the sides over here as well? When we think about giving, we think about the Lord Jesus and what he gave. And so as we go into that spirit of giving this morning, would you just pray with me and thank you for your faithful giving to this church? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for my family and how it has received from this church, this congregation, these people. And Father, as we we celebrate what you have done many years ago, as we take of the Lord's Supper, God, I thank you for what you've done in my heart, in my life. And on the back end of Thanksgiving, we thank you for those who have joined us online. And God, would you just empower us to give faithfully week in and week out. And God, will you use these gifts to further your kingdom in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. We have one more song for you guys before the message. And I just wanted to give you the freedom to just remain in your seats. The words are still going to be on the screen and you're welcome to sing with us, but we just want to bless you guys and just sing this song over you this morning.
I want to say good morning, first of all, to those who are watching online, and of course, to those of you who are here in our building today, uh, thank you. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Frankly, this is a really great crowd for the Sunday after Thanksgiving, so I hope I get a unanimous vote. I hope I do. How many of you had a great Thanksgiving? Just, would you raise your hand? Okay, great. I had, uh, we had, we set the record, we had 45 people at our house 
for Thanksgiving, and I knew half of them. We had people there I was kin to. I didn't even know we were alive. It was unbelievable, but we had a great, great time. But I do have to tell you, I'll make a little confession. I am an early riser. But beginning of Monday this week, we were really under the gun because we the, the number kept adding. We just kept adding people, which is fine. It was okay. But the more people you have, the more you just want to make things right and all of that. And so I basically cleared my calendar, and I said, told Teresa, whatever you want us to do, I'll do it. And, man, we just we worked right up to the last minute to make everything ready. And so I'm a very early riser, as I told you. Well, third, you know, you're, you're like an adrenaline high, all, you know, all day Thursday. So then finally, you know, the last person left, thankfully. And um, it was about 9.30, and uh, so I kind of decompressed a little bit. I went to bed, turned out the light at 11 o'clock, and um, I, I noticed uh, I was sleeping, and I don't have to set an alarm. I'm usually up at 6, 6.15. So I turned over and I looked outside and I thought, gosh, the light's awfully bright to be 6.15. It was 8.45. I had moved for eight hours and, I mean, whatever time that is, I just couldn't believe it. And I felt so guilty. But I feel great. And so anyway, I'm glad that you came. Before we kind of get started this morning, let me just kind of tell some of you out there who are watching online and those of you who are here, kind of what's going on. First of all, I told you last week, but I want to tell you again, I really want you to take this seriously. One of the greatest outreach times the church has, the two biggest times we have is the church to outreach and reach out are Christmas and Easter. People are so open to the Christmas season and during Easter. Well, this year, I'm beginning a series. Next Sunday, we're going to preach three weeks. And the title of my series is All I Want for Christmas. And there are three things I want for Christmas, and I want them every Christmas for the rest of my life. In fact, I want them every day the rest of my life. And I've never done a series like this before. I'm not going to tell you what those gifts are, but I will tell you when I finish the series, you will be saying, you know, Pastor, every day, that's what I want. Not just Christmas Day, every day. It's one of the most creative things I've ever done that God's ever given me. So we're going to be talking about all I want for Christmas. You will not believe what these gifts are and how great they are, how happy you will be if you have them and how they'll impact your life. So be sure right now, be thinking about somebody that you can invite to come to our Christmas services. Then, speaking about Christmas, let me tell you what we're doing as a Christmas outreach. And we're hoping all of you will get involved in one of or more of three things that we're doing this year. So let me just kind of outline those for you very, very quickly. Number one, we're going to be serving all the first responders in our area, police and fire people, all the first responders. Number two, we're going to be serving families that are in need that won't have a Christmas unless we provide it through our local schools. Number three, we're going to be asking you at the end of the day today, we're going to ask you to bake bread for your neighbors and invite them to church at Christmas. Now, all the outreach kits are located out in our lobby. And if you want to know more about how you can get involved in one or more of those things, go to crosspointchurch.com slash Christmas. That's all you got to do. So you may say, you may have, for example, a relative or someone you know that's a first responder. And you say, I'd like to do something for first responders. We'll tell you how to do that. You may say, you know, we'd like to maybe get involved in helping to reach a needy family and provide a needy family for Christmas. We're, we're mainly doing this through our small groups, by the way. My small group has agreed we're going to take four families in my small group. We're going to provide a meal for them, Christmas for them, and really try to get to know them and get them involved in the life of our church. So you can do that. Or, you, you know, you might, want to, um, you might want to take, we hope all of you will do this, go take the kit that's out there, and let me just be clear we're asking you, we're calling them bread pans. I want to pronounce that first word, bread pans. Not bed pans, bread <laughs> pans. We're asking you to take a bread pan. There's a kit. You can make, make banana nut bread and take them to your neighbors and invite them to our Christmas Eve service. Now, having that said, said that, most all of us know what uh, the term RSVP means. You get an invitation, and if there's an RSVP, that actually comes from a French phrase, and it literally means, please respond. The song that we just sang was so wonderful, and it ties into what we're doing. For those of you that do not know, this is one of the Sundays of the year that we take the Lord's Supper. Now, sometimes we get asked, in fact, I was talking to a, a, a good, a dear person, a person that's very close to me, 
who attends a very liturgical church. They do Advent and, and all of those kind of things, and they have a very, very strict, you know, kind of a high church approach to worship, which is fine. But they do the Lord's Supper every single Sunday. And so sometimes we get asked, why don't we do it every single Sunday? So I want to say two or three things to clarify. Number one, there's nothing wrong with taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Don't have a problem with that at all. Number two, the Bible doesn't say how often you should take it. It just says as often as you do it, make sure you do it right. And so we, we here in our church, our philosophy is more of we believe that if you just do something over and over like that, it becomes kind of a tag on it doesn't mean a lot. So when we do it, we put the laser focus on the supper. That's what everything is focused around. Everything is based around the supper, which is what we're going to be doing today. That said, that song is true. When Jesus said, take and eat, that invitation is for everybody. Everybody is invited to the Lord's table. But you do have to RSVP. You do have to accept his invitation. And the way you accept his invitation is, number one, you commit your life to him. You receive him as your Lord and Savior. We believe that you ought to be biblically baptized. We don't require that part, but we believe you should do that. And those are the people that could come to the supper and should come to the supper. So we respectfully say to all anybody that may be in the building, you're not a believer, you're not a follower of Jesus. We love you. We're glad you're here. We pray for you. We pray one day that you will. But we would ask you respectfully not to take part in the Lord's Supper. So other than that, whether you're a member of this church or not, whether you're a member of any denomination or not, if you know the Lord, you've trusted the Lord, you love the Lord, and you've followed Him, and you're following Him now, then we invite you in just a moment to take the Lord's Supper now. We're in a passage, if you want to look about in your Bible, we're going to look at a short passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's in the New Testament. You go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. All right, I think that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, that's the uh, what? Seventh book in the New Testament. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to put these verses up on the screen, and I'm going to read them to you. Then we're going to go back, and I want to pull out about four of these verses, and I want to show you what we ought to do every single time we take the Lord's Supper. Because before you take the Supper, you need to look at the Supper. And you'll find that when you look at the Supper, and you look at what we're doing, and why we're doing, and how we're supposed to do it, you're going to find out that the Apostle Paul said, we actually ought to take three different looks every time we come to the table, and we take the Lord's Supper. So let's just read these verses. I'm going to read them to you. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and they drink from the cup. Now, that's all we're going to read. We're going to go back and pull through some of those verses out. But just a cursory reading of that passage tells us something automatically. What we're about to do is serious business. I mean, it's very serious business. As a matter of fact, if you read this entire passage, there were people in the Corinthian church that died on the spot because they were not taking the Lord's Supper the way they ought to take it, and they were not being the people that they ought to be. And they were showing unbelievable disrespect and irreverence to the God who gave us His life. And so this is very serious business, number one. Number two, we ought to take it seriously. Because I do believe sometimes, even under the best intentions, we come and we kind of say, ho-hum, yep, we do this. This is that time of the year when we kind of take the bread and drink the cup and we go our merry way. No, that's not what we do. We are to take the Lord's Supper in a very worthy fashion. Again, people misunderstand. They'll read this passage. And they'll say, I've had people say, well, I'm not worthy to take the Lord's Supper. I got news for you. There ain't nobody in this room worthy to take the Lord's Supper. 
So get that right out right now. We do not take the Lord's Supper, no pun intended. It has nothing to do with our merit. It has nothing to do with our performance. It has nothing to do with whether we've been naughty or nice. That is not what he's talking about. The issue is not, are you worthy to participate? Because the only reason we're worthy to participate is because of him and his grace, not because of our goodness. On the other hand, we are to make sure that we take it in a worthy manner and we do it with a worthy motive. So the reason why I will take the supper and you will take the supper has nothing to do with the fact that you go to church, you've been baptized, you're religious, you dot the I's, you cross the T's, has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that he died, he came back from the grave so that he could give us his righteousness and we could be worthy to take the supper. So what we're about to do, we do it by the grace of God, we do it with the grace of God, we do it through the grace of God, we do it in the grace of God. Now having said that, he says in verse 28, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So here's what Paul said. He said, now before you take this supper, you need to look within. You need to put yourself under a spiritual MRI. You need to have a spiritual CAT scan. You need to really look yourself in the mirror. You really need to open yourself up and look into your heart. You need to examine yourself. And you need to ask yourself this question. The question you need to ask is, is there anything between me and Jesus? Is there any hidden sin in my life? Is there anything that I know that would cause me to take the Lord's Supper with even a little spot of dirt on my hands, with even a speck of dirt in my heart. He said, you need to examine yourself. One of the reasons why I love the Lord's Supper is because when you do take the Lord's Supper, you, you're forced to do this. You're forced to do something that, quite frankly, for some of you may be very uncomfortable. Because right now, maybe you'd say, yeah, I've, uh, I've got a grudge against my ex-spouse who walked out on me. Or yeah, I've got a grudge because um, I lost my job after I'd been there for 30 years and I got kicked out for a younger person. Or yeah, I've got a problem because I have a, um, I have a hidden sin that I just kind of, it's kind of my pet sin and I'm just not willing to give it up. Or yeah, I, I, I have a problem because, you know, I'm, frankly, I'm neglecting to spend time with the Lord. I'm not in God's Word. Or yeah, I, I do have a problem because I have a bitter spirit. I don't know what it is. But one of the beautiful things about taking the Lord's Supper is, is God forces us to stop, put everything aside, and say, look, let's get honest now with two people. Get honest with me. I already know anyway, but get honest with yourself. Examine yourselves. Ask yourself. Be willing to ask yourself, Lord, is there anything, 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 anything between me and you? It's when you get before the Lord and you say what I say every day. It's a prayer I pray every day. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. So the first look we need to take is within. So I want you to take a moment. And we're not, we don't do this often. And it may seem a little bit awkward, but it shouldn't be. But I want you to take a moment. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes. I want you to forget everything else that's on your mind right now. Forget everything. Clear everything out. You're going to do business with God, and you're going to examine yourself. And in your heart right now, I want you to pray this prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. And as you're praying right now, pray it and mean it. Lord, search me. Is there any secret sin? Is there some sin I forgot? Is there something that I've done I shouldn't have done or didn't do I should have done? Is there a person that I need to forgive? Is there a habit that I need to forsake? Is there an action I need to begin? 
And let's just be quiet for a moment. And you just do business with God. But be willing to do business. And whatever he reveals to you, whatever it may be, you confess it and repent of it. And then remember this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I don't know my heart. We don't know our hearts. We don't know each other's hearts. The heart's deceitfully wicked. Nobody can know it. But Lord, as you have searched my heart, even this morning as I ask you to search my heart, Lord, I can say before our church and before our people, as far as I know, with all that lies within me and what you've revealed to me, there's nothing between me and you. I am not a perfect person, but I'm blameless today because I want to take this supper with clean hands and a clean heart. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I got to do a little housekeeping here. Jim, I need you to get me an element because they forgot to get it. If you'll get that ready, and you already got that for me? Good deal. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that very much. Now, first thing we want to do is we want to look within. First thing. Then he says something else, and he says this in verses 24 and 25. Let me read it again. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me in the same way. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So Paul said, first thing you need to do before you take the Lord's Supper, you've got to look within. Is there anything between me and the Lord? Nope. Good there. All right. Then he says, you've got to look back. You look within, then you look backwards. This is a memorial. What we're about to do is a memorial supper. I don't know if you've ever been to Arlington Cemetery, uh, uh, Cemetery or not. I've been to Arlington Cemetery. And one of the things I went to, one of the things I wanted to see was the, the grave of John F. Kennedy. And President Kennedy has the eternal flame. And what that basically, that flame is just, it's an eternal memorial to him. It's an eternal reminder, or at least as long as we're on this earth, it is a reminder of, you know, of, of President Kennedy and, and, you know, that terrible day when he's assassinated and so forth. Well, this is a memorial supper. When we come together, Jesus said, I want you to remember my death. But I want you to remember in, in a graphic way, I want you to remember my body, how my body was beaten and bloodied and bruised and whipped and scourged. And I want you to remember the blood that I shed. I want you to remember my body, and I want you to remember my blood. I want you in your imagination this. I want you to go back to the Garden of, the, Garden of Gethsemane. When I so agonized over what I was going to do for you, I sweat drops of blood. I want you to think about that. And I want you to think about how, carrying that unbelievably heavy cross on a back that you wouldn't even recognize it was ribbons of flesh that so exhausted me I got to the point where even I could not carry it any longer then I want you to think about how that crown of thorns was jammed down on my head and I want you to think about how those spikes were driven through my wrist and I want you to think about how those spikes were driven through my hands and I want you to think about how I was lifted up on that cross And I want you to think about the blood that I shed on that cross, how just one drop of blood was sufficient to pay for your sins and my sins and for the sins of the whole world. And I want the cross and my death to linger over your mind and over your heart and over your attitude and over your ambition. I want you in your mind right now to stand at the foot of the cross like those Roman soldiers did and like the Apostle John did and like his mother did. I want you to stand at the cross and in your mind, I want you to block everything out and just remember what I did for you. So I want you right now to bow your heads. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about one thing, the cross. The cross. That's all I want you to think about, the cross. And then whatever you want to say to the Lord about the cross, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for taking on the cross 
what I would have had to have taken for all eternity if you had not taken what you took on the cross. Thank you not just for being born. Thank you not just for living. Thank you for dying, and thank you for dying for me. So take just a moment and ask the Lord and talk to the Lord and focus on what Jesus did for you. Lord, when I look at the cross, here's what I'm reminded of. Yes, you died for me, but I'm the one that put you to death. I was that Roman soldier that whipped you. I was that Roman soldier that jammed that crown of thorns down on your head. I was that Roman soldier that nailed you to that cross and raised you up to hang. I was in that crowd mocking you, making fun of you. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Not realizing that you could save others because you didn't save yourself. I want to live my life in the shadow of your cross. I want to live a humble, holy life, forever grateful that you love me enough to die for me. We love you, Lord Jesus. Yes, you are the crucified Lord, but we thank God that's not where the story ends. Amen. So Paul said, before you take the supper, you better look inward. I'm right with the Lord. But then you better look backward. Remember why we're doing this to begin with. But then he said one last thing, and he says this in verse 26. He said, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He said, not only do you look inward, and not only do you look backward, you look forward. I believe that one of the things that makes people an orthodox Christian, a true Christian, is you don't just believe in the virgin birth, though I do. You don't just believe in his sinless life, though I do. You don't just believe in his sacrificial death, though I do. And you don't just believe in his physical, literal resurrection, though I do. You believe he's coming again. I believe he's coming again. I believe just as he left, He's coming again, and he said, every time you have this supper, every time you observe this, do not leave me on the cross, because I came back from the dead, and I ascended into heaven, and I am coming back again. You know, there's two things I think about. Every time I think about this, I think about, you know, what I'm supposed to be looking for. Have you ever thought about two things? I'll close with this, and we'll take the supper. <laughs> Have you ever thought about when Jesus ascended back into heaven? Have you ever thought about that? He'd been gone for 33 years. So he dies, and he spends another 40 days. After he comes back from the you know, tomb, he comes out of the tomb, he, he spends 40 days, and he's standing on the Mount of Olives, and he says his goodbye, and while they're standing there talking, he's taken up into the sky. And he says, now, just as I left, I, I'm coming back, and I believe every word of that. Have you ever thought about when he walked into heaven? This is just my sanctified, glorified, we're 12 and 0 imagination. <laughs> so the doors of heaven open and all the streets are lined with all the angels of heaven. And the Heavenly Father is sitting on the throne at the end of a golden street. And in walks Jesus. This is just my imagination. 
I think the angels begin to flap their wings, begin to shout, he's back. I think they bowed their knees in homage to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I just imagine Gabriel just shouted out and said, Lord, we're so glad you're back. It just hasn't been heaven without you. And he comes to the Father. And the Father rises. And wraps his arm around him. Says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then I think about that day, and I'm not on the, you know, people have all these debates about, you know, pre-trib, trib, post-trib, you know, amillennial, post-millennial, pre I'm pan-millennial. It's just going to pan out. That's all I know. <laughs> I just know he's coming again. Do you ever just stop and think? If you happen to be one of the ones that are alive, when the clouds part and everything stops and all the world sees him coming and everybody that's ever lived knows once and for all, yep, he was who he said he was. And he did what he said he did. Or can you imagine that you're one of the ones that you come with him, which is fine with me. Either way, I'm good either way. If I die to go to be with him and come back, that's fine. If he comes back before I die, that's fine. Have you ever thought about that? We don't think about it enough. We need to live under the shadow of the cross for sure, but we need to live in light of the second coming, meaning every day we're ready. Whenever he's ready to come, we're ready. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment? Think about one thing. Just think about his coming. It is not a coincidence it is not a coincidence that the last words of the last book of the Bible, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we do look forward to that day when you're coming again and we are proclaiming to a lost world there is a Lord a Savior, a Master, a King a Redeemer that's coming again and we need to be ready for that coming so we say today as a church we're not ashamed of the gospel we're not ashamed of grace and we're not ashamed of the goodness of a God that would send his son to die for us so with his bowed and with eyes closed, if you're here today or you're watching right now and you've never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we just want to give you a chance to do that. I want to give you a chance to RSVP to the Lord by simply just saying this, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I've been reminded once again, you're that Savior. The bread's your body. The cup is your blood. And I have no hope of salvation outside of you. None. But I have every hope because of you. So today, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. I believe you're alive right now. I confess you as my Lord. I receive you as my Savior. I repent of my sins and I give all of my life to you. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God saves you. Now, if you're in this room today and you prayed to receive Christ, I want to encourage you to do something. When this service is over, there's a table out in our lobby called Connection Point. If you really prayed to receive Jesus, you want somebody to know it. You're not ashamed of it. I'm going to ask you to go to that table. There'll be someone waiting to talk to you there. And all you got to do is say, you know, I, I pray to receive Christ. I RSVP'd today, gave my life to Jesus. Just go to them and tell them. That, that's all you need to do. They'll take care of everything else. They'll tell you what your next steps are. 
If you've been saved, you say, well, I've already done that. I've trusted Christ. Well, have you been biblically baptized? Well, no, I haven't done that. You need to make an appointment to do that. We're going to be baptizing Christmas Eve. It'll be a great time for you to be baptized. If you'll just go to our table and say, hey, I, I'm a believer, but you know I've never been biblically baptized. I'd like to do that. I need to do that. Just go to that table. Let them know. If you have a spiritual need, you can do that. Now, if you're not here, but you want to make a decision, you'd like for us to help you take your next steps with God, you do one of two things. Either go to crosspointchurch.com slash decision right now. Do that on your computer, iPhone, or whatever. Or just text Jesus to 678-255-2566. That's all that you need to do. Now, all of us in the building, if you'll just look up here, if you'll get ready to take the bread that we have given to you, and then we're going to ask you to take the cup as well. If you would just do this, Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. You do this in remembrance of me. We're a church that frankly believes that this is not a sacrament. There's no saving grace in the bread. We just, I don't believe that. We don't believe it somehow. This is somehow the body. When Jesus said that, his body was there. It's not the body. This is a picture of his body, but it is a picture of his body. And he blessed it, and Lord, I bless it. And he says, as often as you take this bread, you do it in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you for your body, that beautiful, precious, perfect body that never sinned given for us. We love you and bless you for it. And then the scripture says he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What's a covenant? It's a promise. God never breaks a promise. The new covenant simply is, you're not under law, you're under grace. By grace are you saved through faith. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. When you do, drink it, you do it in remembrance of of me. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood. I know there are some people today, they scoff at the blood. They make fun of a bloody religion. Well, Lord, you said in your word, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But because of your blood, there's forgiveness for anyone and everyone that would give their life to you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Now, we're going to sing one last song before you leave. Let me remind you as we stand, if you'll just go ahead and stand to your feet right now. We've got one last worship song we're going to sing. I would ask you as you leave, it is dishonoring to the Lord's Supper to leave what Jesus has done for us in this building. So I'm going to ask every one of you to be unanimous in one thing. Get involved in our Christmas outreach some way, somehow. Go to our website. I've already told you the, the, the website to go to. You can help with first responders. Everybody can take a, a bread pan, bake some banana net and up bread, and go to your, your, your uh, uh, neighbors and invite them to our Christmas Eve service. You know, there's something everybody can do. You can adopt a family. If you're in a small group, we ask every small group to do at least one. But some of you may say, I would like to take a family. That would be great. But let's get involved in reaching out to people that need Jesus. Thank you for coming.
getting into that church as we are sent out of the building. I have one quick announcement. Um, on December 12th, 12th we're going to vote for our next annual budget. So if you'd like a copy of the budget like this, if you go to our First Impressions desk, they'll glad you give you one there. And again, as we go into this Christmas season, again, crosspointchurch.com slash Christmas, real easy. Um, RSVP, if you have a preschooler, we only have preschool activities at the three o'clock service. So make sure you register for that. Let our preschool team know. And again, as we are sent, remember, as we go into this season, that Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us, was born to die as we celebrated today in the Lord's Supper so we can have a relationship with him. Church, we love you. You are sent.